Well, welcome everybody uh, to this eighth seminar in the Future of Development series. This is a series we run where we bring in distinguished scholars in the field of international development, have them talk about their body of scholarship, but also talk about the implications for the future. And I'm particularly delighted to uh, welcome Chris Blackland. Uh, Chris is the Romilly E. Pearson Professor of Global Conflict Studies at the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. And he has just published a book called Why We Fight, uh, that is uh, gonna be a, an important contribution to the whole problem of fragility uh, and conflict that is spreading in the, in the world. I should say that when Chris told me about the book's title about a year ago, I think, I was always worried about that, that word we, you know, why we fight, uh, because I didn't think we fought. Uh, but I'm from Sri Lanka, and just in the last 24 hours, I see what he's talking about, because the country has gone into a major conflict uh, on, uh, uh, of uh, both protesters against the government and pro government uh, forces. Uh, I'm equally delighted to welcome Kate Cronin Furman. Uh, in the London office, uh, in, in, the, you know, in CGD's London office, uh, what's it called, Abbey Road? No, uh, mm -hmm. Abbey Gardens. Mm -hmm. Abbey Road is a Beatles uh, song, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and Kate is an associate professor of human rights and uh, the director of the uh, of human rights uh, masters at the University College London. So this is our first, uh, and, and welcome to everybody because this is the first of the series that is actually in person. Uh, so uh, we, the series was born during the pandemic, and so we're just emerging from it. Uh, so we will go first to Chris, who will speak for about 30 minutes, uh, and then to Kate for uh, her discussions remarks, and then we'll open it up to the audience, uh, both in person um, as well as on Zoom. And if you're on Zoom, uh, just send in your uh, questions on the, the chat. Uh, so let me welcome Chris Black. Great, well, thank you for having me. Um, and thanks also to uh, Kate for, for joining virtually. Uh, Kate and I were, before we were professors, were bloggers. And, and so back in, my gosh, it was 2007. So it sort of feels like bringing the band back together. Uh, she was always the funny one, though, so hopefully she won't upstage me again. Um, so I wrote this book called Why We Fight. I wrote it because nobody else was writing it. Uh, there were all these lessons from decades of research, not just economics and political science, which is the intersection where I dwell, but uh, from psychology, from anthropology, from sociology, from people who are just engaged in the daily practice. And it, I think we had a lot of answers to both why we fight and also what to do about it. And whether it was village leaders or gang leaders or world leaders that I would meet, nobody seemed to actually be aware of any of this. That seemed like a problem. Uh, and so I tried to boil it down for general audience. And so boiling three decades of decades and decades of research from different disciplines into one book was hard enough. Uh, then I have to do, down, boil it down into a 20 or 30 minute talk. But then Shanta says, I also have to talk about the future of development. <laughs> so I'm going to attempt to give you maybe a few big ideas from the book in 10, 15 minutes. And then I'm going to tell you about the entire future development conflict in another 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, pilot, really. All right. And so I, I hope you'll consider uh, it's, it's with booksellers everywhere, obviously. I think there was a link somewhere in the web page and things if you want to have a 30% discounted copy, you can go metal ship the day after the event, which I think is tomorrow. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, so, but let me begin by saying that I could have called this book, Why We Don't Fight. Uh, that would not have probably sold as many books. Uh, <laughs> however, it's, it's a really, really important starting point for us to understand why war happens, right? Like a doctor, Right, we have to pay attention to the critically ill patient. Right, so we write medical death textbooks on disease. We don't call it why we're healthy. Uh, we call it how to get healthy, and so that's kind of what this 
the better. Right? But it, I wanted to start with this premise that enemies prefer to loathe the weak. And, and that seems like a strange message for this moment when there's this horrendous war in Ukraine and you know, fear is arising again of World War III. But the problem is, is we tend, what, like the first message of the book is that we pay, pay too much attention to the conflicts that happen and not to the conflicts that don't happen. So for example, most people didn't notice two weeks into Russia's invasion of Ukraine, India accidentally launched cruise missile at Pakistan. And common suits, right? Predictably. Uh, war would have been just so unimaginably costly for both sides that they both sides strove for peace and not to escalate as they have for decades. And and I and if I were giving you the longer book talk, I could walk through how. Everyone remembers the US invasion of Afghanistan. Nobody talks about the US invasion of Haiti because it was over before it began, and so on and so on and so on. There are all of these stories of conflicts that didn't happen. Vladimir Putin spent 20 years trying to co-op Ukraine to every means possible, dark money, assassination, propaganda, uh, uh, support for separatists before turning to war. The war, when it does happen, is often the last resort because it's so and that's sort of a, a starting point for the book. It's a basic insight. You could say it goes back to some people say, oh, I learned this from Jim Fearing. And some people said, oh, I learned this from labor economists studying labor strikes. And some people say, oh, I learned this from Thomas Schelling. But we actually learned this from Mao, or we could learn it from von Clausen. All right. And it's the idea that, that, we, that, that war is politics by other means, is the famous quote from von Clausen. Or, or politics, or war is just politics with bloodshed, it comes from Chairman Mao. And it's the idea that you have a choice to achieve your objectives, whether it's territory or issue or whatever. You can, you can not fight or not fight, right? And you can threaten to fight, right, in order to achieve what you want, and then hope that the threat of fighting sort of gets the concession. And the problem with one of those options, fighting, is that it destroys a share of the thing that you're trying to fight. And, and therefore, you both sides have these very powerful incentives. Those costs of war are the incentive for peace. And the more costly is war, the more peace is likely in some sense, or the more incentives there are for peace. Uh, but as I said, I didn't write a book called Why We Don't Fight. I wrote a book about why we fight. And the answer to that uh, is really like every single answer to why we fight is a reason that a society or its leaders overlooked those costs or decided to pay them for another reason, right? Basically, there's a reason for every war and a war for every reason, but, there's, but they all sort of follow that same logic. It's, it's a lens. It's, this is just a new lens through which to look at why conflict happens. And then hopefully it's a hopeful one, A, because you know, if we were a doctor and we thought everybody was critically ill, you'd be pretty demoralized, right? So it's good news that most people are healthy. Right, so it's good news most people are healthy. I want you to speak louder. Okay, it's good news that most people are healthy. Uh, and, uh, and that there's powerful incentives. These costs of war are like a gravitational pull that, that pull towards peace. Okay, the other good news, I suppose, is that even though there is a reason for every war and a war for every reason, most of these reasons fit into one of five logics, right? They, they, they operate, we, they correspond to a particular set of five different ways in which we overlook the cost. Uh, and you can think of them as being unaccountable, ideological, biased, uncertain, or unreliable. Okay, what do I mean? Let me use the current conflict in, in Ukraine just as an example, right? Vladimir Putin is an autocrat. Not only that, he's a personalized ruler. And he's really concentrated person himself. That's about as unaccountable to the wider public, even to the wider group of elites, as you can get in a polity. All right. And that means that a lot of the costs that all of those other people bear, he doesn't have to consider. I mean, he has to consider them somewhat. There's always a coup threat, et cetera, et cetera. But he's not fully accountable for those costs. And so he's too ready to use violence. Also, like a lot of leaders, in particular autocrats, in particular personalized autocrats, he may have personal incentives to use violence 
to preserve power, not because it's in the interest of the Russian people, but because it's in the interest of him and his regime. So for example, if, if you have a democracy on your doorstep, one that has tossed out Russian facing rulers twice in two revolutions in the last 20 years, that's a potential icon and, and example, a dangerous one from Putin's point of view uh, to your own dissidents. That's also a private incentive. Right? Democracy is not a threat to the Russian people. Democracy is a threat to Putin. Okay, and so these kinds of unchecked leaders is one of the first reasons, and maybe the most common reason that many places find themselves fighting. The second are a set of ideological, or in the book, what I call intangible incentives. They're ethereal things that you get through war that you cannot get otherwise. All right, and so in, 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 in this case, every story you've heard of Putin pursuing personal glory, a place in history, being the next path from the great, that's an intangible incentive for fighting. Every story you've also heard about his aims for uh, uh, to reclaiming the Russian Empire, trying to uh, uh, account, you know, basically get back from this humiliation of the past two decades. Again, these ethereal, intangible incentives that he obtains through war. That's a story of ideological and intangible incentives. We've also heard stories of Putin being isolated, insulated, getting bad information institutionally because autocrats have to surround themselves and coup proof themselves with, with yes men, and that is often going to distort information. That's the classic dictator's premise. How do I actually get, how do I maintain control while still getting good information? Leaders can also be psychologically biased in that even if they're getting the right information, they consume it selectively. They're overconfident, right? And we know this, this persists in really high stakes environments. Our mutual fund managers are overconfident. Our CEOs are typically overconfident. And they make persistent mistakes in high stakes situations. So that's also a potential cost. So they're overlooking the cost of war. You're basically underestimating the cost. We're just getting that cost benefit calculus wrong, right? So that's a kind of story. Now you don't have to believe that story. You can say, oh, I don't believe that's true. Or you can say that's the entire story. I'm just telling you that's the kind of story this is. It's through this lens of ignoring the cost. Now, a lot of the time, the things we, we look back at these, at the outcome of this, and we say, oh, he missed, you know, he miscalculated. He was biased, he was insulated, he got this wrong. Well, that's surely true to an extent. We, always, we often forget, you know, hindsight's 2020, right? We often forget just how uncertain these things were three months ago. How uh, uncertain it was, just how strong and plucky and resolved the Ukrainians would be. The leadership capabilities of Zelensky, who had a 23% popularity rating, right? He might very well have gotten on a plane for all we need. Uh, the strength and capacity of the Russian military, the, the unity of the West on sanctions and their willingness to basically fund a forever war, if that's what it takes, right? The idea that Putin would get a bad draw in this uncertain world where all of those things were unknown, the idea that Putin would get a bad draw on every single one of those was predicted by no one. All right, and so amidst this uncertainty, it's possible to gamble and get it wrong. Moreover, there's a strategic element, and this, this and the, the final one start to bring in some game theory, right? We've talked about politics, we've talked about psychology. Now we're getting into some of the insights from, from game theory, which is, and all of you get this if you've ever played poker, you can't observe your, your opponent's hand, right? You know that they, they're signaling that they're strong. No, 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 Ukraine, we're super, we're super resolved. And yes, the West, oh, we're super unified. And we'll, of course, we'll pay for this war, but you don't know if they're bluffing. And your optimal strategy in that situation, in poker, in game theory, is not just a fold, right? It's sometimes you call. Calling is expensive choice in this case, but sometimes it happens, right? And that's one of the strategic logics. And, and after the fact, you say, oh, he miscalculated. But you mix that up with also, also gambling in those circumstances where there's strategic incentives to, to call a potential bluff, even when it's not a bluff. Is it? And then the final set of explanations uh, is what political economists call a commitment problem. One side can't commit to the deal you'd like to make. War is costly. Both like to avoid it. There's a deal on the table, but you can't trust the other side to keep that deal. Ukraine isn't sure if they, uh, if they cede some territory, ground, 
semi-sovereignty to Russia. We'll do just use that to seize more next time, carving off slice by slice, right? Maybe more importantly, Russia, arguably earlier this year, late last year, was up there peak leverage vis-a-vis -vis Europe and the West. Economy has been growing, now stagnating. Ukraine, not growing, but its economy can't get worse. It's been stagnant for 30 years, probably going to move in a positive direction. But more importantly, they're acquiring Turkish drones. They're, acquiring, they're building their own Neptune missiles, uh, potentially going to get armed by the West. Uh, and they're creeping closer towards democracy and that democratic paradigm that is a, that is a, a, a potential threat to Putin's regime. And Ukraine can't commit not to do any of these things, right? Any leader who tried to commit to say, let some stooges in, seed some semi-sovereign, given the popular mood at the time, probably would have been turfed out of office. So there's a commitment problem there. So there was a deal that had Ukraine giving up some of its sovereignty that it didn't want to give up and it couldn't give up. And, and so Russia thought, you can argue, again, you don't have to believe this, this is just the kind of argument this is, Russia's locking in its back, right? And that's the kind of story alongside some of these others that are used to explain World War I, World War II, the US invasion of Iraq, the US invasion of Afghanistan, my own work, civil wars, gang wars, uh, ethnic conflicts, all of them in some sense. Those, all these stories you hear can, you, this is a lens through which you can, can view them. All right, and if you, uh, you know, if you're a political economist, uh, you know, there's technical terms for these. The first one's an agency problem. The second one is from, you know, behavioral science, you think of non-standard preference and in your utility function that you pursue despite the cost. Uh, there's all sorts of, distorted to believe so-called irrationalities, but basically ways that humans are systematically biased, behavioral psychology, political psychology, behavioral economics have given us, right? Although once you start thinking about war and strategic interactions, why you buy a gym membership you don't use, that kind of behavioral stuff isn't so useful. It's all the behavioral interactions that matter for strategic relationships you don't study as much, which we need to pay attention to. Uh, uncertainties about asymmetric information, the need for reputation building, and then finally, as I mentioned, Uh, that's the first half of the book. And every answer to why we don't fight is, 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 is sorry, that's the first half of the book. But if, I, if there's one meta cause, uh, it's one that I learned from Amos Sawyer. Amos Sawyer was an activist, uh, a political science professor in Liberia. Uh, and ultimately, when Charles Taylor invaded Liberia in Christmas 1989, and Nigerian forces held the capital against him capturing it. He was chosen in exile by political parties, civil society, to serve as an interim president in Monrovia for four years. Uh, he was also, uh, when Charles Taylor eventually took over the country, he fled. He ended up at Indiana University, Bloomington, with Eleanor Ostrom, to continue being a political scientist, write his books, where he became a mentor uh, and a dissertation advisor to my wife and thereby a mentor and advisor to me. And he invited us to work in Liberia with him, which we did uh, for many years. And the thing I learned from Amos, now Amos, didn't, was, Amos was a comparative historian and a student of West African politics and a politician and a president, one of the most gentle and, and principled politicians that maybe the continent has ever seen. Um, and his story, he didn't talk about agency problems and asymmetric information, but you look at his story through that lens, and what he was saying is the fundamental problem in, in West Africa, but in, in Africa in general, maybe for conflict in general, is centralized in unita unitary government, over-centralized power. And that's because centralized power accentuates all five causes of war. So the idea that you're unaccountable not accountable for the costs, unchecked, be ready to use violence, pursuing your private interests. That's obvious. That's almost a mechanical function of centralized. A little bit more subtle, well, the more centralized that government, the more personalized the ruler, we're now vulnerable to their personal ideological aims, right? We're more vulnerable to their idiosyncratic biases. Not only that, but these centralized governments are often institutionally constructed to sort of get biased. I just talked about the Putin example, but that's, if you look at the 
the, the study of autocratic politics is a classic problem. Uh, it can be more uncertain, right? How easy is it for a personalized ruler to send credible signals? Uh, but most importantly, it's impossible, often impossible for an all powerful centralized autocrat to make credible commitments. This is a, a, a problem throughout history. Autocrats is another huge problem. It makes it hard to raise taxes. It makes it hard to write treaties. It makes it hard to make deals uh, with your own people. And it makes it hard to make deals with other, other nations right, and other groups. Okay, so it's, and arguably the meta cause and the, 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 root cause, the most common root cause of conflict throughout history is over centralized power. And as it happened, so, and, and so, you know, if you go back to Hobbes, Hobbes was concerned with the state of war, right? And that life would be nasty, brutish, and short. Now, it's interesting, when he talked about war, which is spelled W-A-R-R-E, uh, he didn't actually, he meant violent conflict. Mostly he meant this hostile competition, this constant struggle that was often not violent. So he actually wasn't talking about sort of the prolonged fighting necessarily that that I'm talking about here. He's talking both about the prolonged fighting, this hostile competition, and the army, the fact that you just got to devote so much of your time to army. Both of those things, the fighting and the army, are hugely inefficient. So he said, make us a king, give us a Leviathan, and that will create peace because we'll, that person will compel us to disarm, right? And will actually stop us from fighting to create peace in the society. And that's the state. And actually, states are really, really good at doing that mostly in their society. Right? And so the Leviathan works reasonably well, and it's worked better than in Hobbes' time as state has become more accountable and less just at creating peace internally. But it turns out that the Leviathan is really, really bad at avoiding conflict with other people. Okay, and so that's the, that's the double edge here. This story of over-centralized power, I teach a class called How to Change the World, which is basically the social science of what social scientists have to say about what makes good and bad policy, not just about conflict, not just about international development, just in general. And so whether you go to Jane Jacobs talking about American cities, uh, Eleanor Ostrom talking about governing resources, James Ferguson, who was thinking about, who, who is an anthropologist who studied the Spidey tribe of health economists, uh, Judith Kendler, a political economist who tried to understand why some states and municipalities in Brazil were more successful than others. And James Scott, who, who tried to understand everything from how, how, how planners uh, mess up cities and forests, countries, and so on. The main message of all of these thinkers who have studied good and bad policy is the fundamental problem with bad policy is unaccountable power, over-centralized power. So this is not just a problem for uh, for, for, for conflict, it's actually potentially, it's, conflict's just one example of the bad decisions that, that leaders make when there are not checks and balances. Now, because I'm coming from the University of Chicago, I feel, and because I want to trigger Tate, uh, I, I want to quote from Greg Becker. Um, arguably, the international architecture we have, uh, the idea of sovereign states and treating with the sovereign and the whole way in which most development organizations function, especially the UN chartered ones, the like UN World Bank and the IMF, is to empower that sovereign, right? So you talk to a World Bank official and you talk to the head of UNICEF, they can't go make a deal with the mayor. They can't lend money to a provincial government. Uh, they can't sign a treaty with anybody except the, the nationally recognized government. Uh, and and that's a problem. So we reinforce, in some ways, the centralization of power by the way we designed our international. It's hard to avoid, just the way it is. At least we can be aware of it. Uh, but on, but if you're if you're one of these centralized diplomats or development workers, it's actually super convenient. You don't have to deal with all these messy people and worry about what the mayor thinks. You just have to make a deal in these centralized centralized regimes with one one person. And so there is this sort of people. There's sort of a love affair with the Kagames of the world or the, the Lee Kuan Yews of the world, right? And, you know, less of a love affair with, with them when they, you know, when, when with, with Mugabe's and things, because when they, things go wrong and they sink their country, 
in their effort to cling on to power, but for at least the time it's a love affair. And, and, and Becker captured some of this when he talked about visionary leaders can accomplish more in autocratic than democratic government. They're, they're unconstrained, they can just make things happen. Super attractive, and that's a real appeal of undemocratic. And it's why a lot of people, not just diplomats, think that, that maybe you need to autocracy before you get caught. You need development first. Okay, but Becker also pointed out that, of course, the other side of autocratic rule is that these badly misguided strong leaders can cause major damage. Whereas in, in democracies, these visionaries' accomplishments are constrained. Right? And he's not talking about just being constrained by elections. There's a due process. There's legislative constraints, judicial constraints. There's interest groups that are informally operating. Right? And, it's the, and also there's a, a, a free press, there's television, there's, and, and, and now a, a, a competitive uh, internet. Right? So he's talking about all these checks and balances that in some sense make constrain the power rulers to get things done, but also constrain them from screwing things up. And there is a big focus in the international development community on accountability, but it, it's only a slight exaggeration to say that it starts and ends with elections for the president. Okay, and electing a centralized executive is an incomplete at best. So think of Anna Sawyer uh, went back after the war with Ellen Johnson Shirley as president. She invited him to become the head of a new constitution. And he, every day he woke up trying to decide how to decentralize power, how to check and balance power in Liberia, because the Liberian president has to be one of the most centralized and all-powerful democratic rulers in the world. They appoint every mayor in the country. Right? They appoint every country head. They appoint every judge from the local to the upper, to the highest level. There is a legislature. There is a judiciary, not particularly strong or independent, no budgetary control. Right, every and every dollar runs through the president and her handpicked ministers of planning and finance. And in fact, for a long time, they actually combined these powerful ministries. So it was the same person under the president, right? And so we're lucky to have someone as fair-minded and as forward-looking and as democratic-spirited as Ellen Johnson Shirley. But that's a situation that could very easily bring somebody else less principled, maybe different ideologies, more biased into power. All right, and, uh, and so, and this idea that we think of democracy as elections rather than what Becker just described or what the Nigerian political scientist called, uh, he calls this the trivialization, trivialization of democracy. This, this, because basically in a lot of countries, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, you're electing of someone to be a dictator for four or five years. So whether it is James Madison, or Amos Sawyer, or Amos Sawyer's sort of longtime collaborator and friend, Eleanor Ostrom, there are scholars who have been telling us that peace is polycentric, right? So polycentric, I kind of love and hate this word. I think everyone should know it. I think it comes from Eleanor and Vincent Ostrom, as far as I know. It's the idea that power gets to, needs to get checked in many, many different ways. You can spread it against across branches of government, right? The executive, the legislature, the judiciary. You can also spread it towards independent bureaucracies that are not sort of replaced and just stuffed with supporters of the current executive. Uh, you can have regional decentralization. You can encourage the development of lots of informal checks and balances with interest. Uh, an empowered citizenry, which doesn't just mean the ability to vote, but it actually means mobilizational power, the ability to organize. It means uh, uh, economic or, 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 or material power in the sense of having resources or the ability to sort of have a tax revolt, for example, might even mean military power. It doesn't necessarily have to be the right to bear arms. It could be uh, any other number of, of ways that basically gets the guns out of the hand of a single person. Um, it also means supranational organization, treaties, unions, uh, all sorts of constraints. We increasingly nations are binding themselves to with other nations. And this is the this is to them the secret for Eleanor Ostrom. This was the secret to good environmental governance and good governance of common resources. And to Madison and Sawyer, this was the secret to a long, sustained, successful democratic republic that would not go to war. A few countries 
are trying and experimenting with devolution and federalism. Kenya is a remarkable example of one that's default, not just political uh, decision making, but budgetary decision making to regional levels of government. This is something we take for granted in the United States, for example, it's something we take for granted in Canada, where I grew up. It is central to polycentrism, not just voting locally, but those people can make decisions with real money. They can collect taxes and disperse them. Very, very few developing countries, certainly very few Sub-Saharan African countries have any of this whatsoever. And Amos Sawyer would argue that is central to the instability that we've seen in past decades, the instability of the future. All right. Um, and, 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 and unfortunately, the future doesn't look good for these leaders voluntarily checking themselves. Because you had even someone like Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who invited Sawyer in to understanding his desire to decentralize. The hard thing about that is you, it's giving up power. Very few individuals are willing to do this. Uh, and in the end, she wasn't. And so in some ways, Sawyer failed. Uh, and, and Liberia is just as central as now as it was uh, when, he, when, he was, when he was the head of this commission. And, and the un, also unfortunate thing is basically outsiders, international diplomats, aid workers, sometimes have a very limited role to play. This really fundamentally set of domestic decisions that's going to be made in these countries. Uh, we can try not to make it worse by the, our design of our sort of international architecture, right? But, but, but Certainly, it's we could try to stop pushing them in the opposite direction. Uh, but but beyond that, there's limited things we can do. What we could do is, in some sense, maybe the most we can do is the least, which is to say, I think there are lots of margins. There's a lot of aid that is, empowers the center. We can start to think as a as a chief mechanism of when outsiders are interfering. What could what types of interference? will decentralize rather than centralize power. power. This is a picture I took actually of, of uh, shortly after the war in Liberia, of the international community rebuilt the, uh, the Ministry of Justice. So it's sort of like the scaffolding is kind of symbolic, right? You can, I think, I think the, uh, I think, I think the international community could try to be some of the money in the scaffolding for these domestic efforts uh, to, to have power. It's not a great example because the Minister of Justice at the time actually owned the copyright, the laws, and nobody could get a copy of the laws anywhere in the country, including the courts, because he wanted more money than people would pay. So maybe not the perfect example. So still under construction. Uh, but but okay, what, what could be done? I mean, in some sense, literacy and schooling programs, right, is is a is a contribution towards mass is we think facilitates political awakenings, political mobilization, at least over the long run. Uh, anything getting cash transfers out to communities, out to individuals, anything that creates more economic power, uh, decision-making power in those communities is probably going to be helpful. Again, on the margin, a lot of evidence suggests that you're a little less likely to sell your vote when you've got more money in your pocket, for example. So my own research has shown. Uh, building a more thriving uh, industrial sector. Any kind of industrial development, in theory, is going to, that's an interest group. It's going to work against the centralization of power. Uh, trade access could, 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 could promote that. Uh, there's a lot of support. Organizations like International Republican Institute, National Democratic Institute, Carter Center, promoting professionalization of political parties, debates, televised, uh, uh, Discussions, platforms, et cetera, et cetera. There are lots of little things that I think help on the margin, uh, and so on, and so on, and so on. So I, I would, you, and and then of course the flip side is there's a lot of things we do that that, that strengthen the hands of the central government. All right, and so in some sense, just it's it's kind of we could think about reallocating on the margin. This is in some sense I would love it if this was just a central rather than being ignored and never talked about, which is my own impression is if this role of the international community was central to every waking moment of an interaction over a development agreement, over political treaty, uh, which is to say like, where the, is, is to be more polycentric, right? Which is to sort of think of these uh, centralized regimes 
And in what way can incentives, because these, a lot of these unchecked rulers do not have the incentives to check themselves. And there, there are people in those places that would like to check those rulers and we could try to strengthen their hands. Right, and not out of a, and I'm not talking about democratization. That might be part of it, right? There are lots of places with checks and balances. China is a terrific example that are autocratic but highly checked, where there are interest groups, there's local budgets, there's regional devolution, there's independent bureaucracies. Uh, there are, you know, there there's there are sort of there is a, a, a less downward accountability, but there's a lot of we can think a lot more creatively about lateral. And upward accountability in these situations, right? And so it's not about democracy. It's a major theme. So the second half of the book, that's a major theme. It's not about elections, those are part of the solution. It's about checks and balances. Um, and so I just want to dedicate this. Amos Sawyer passed away last month after battling uh, a long fight with cancer. Uh, I think maybe the most important and thoughtful intellectual on the continent, who also happens to be the least read. So I encourage you to uh, uh, go try to read some of his work. Um, and he's been an inspiration for me. I think he was an inspiration for this book. I think it's like the most important message to carry forward. And thank you for inviting me. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, let's now turn to Kate. Chris, you wanna? Sure. All right, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yep. Great. Um, okay, let me first say, Chris, I'm so sorry for your loss in Amos Sawyer. Um, he sounds like an incredible person. Um, I was sort of tempted to spend 10 minutes today talking about everything I learned about the Mounties from reading this book, um, but I'm not gonna do that. Um, I'm also very grateful that the talk you were asked to give was not the standard book talk, but was instead about your vision for the future of development, because while I think this is a really nice synthesis of rationalist explanations for war and other insights, um, I would probably find having to discuss that way more triggering than the Gary Becker quote, simply because it would give me comprehensive exams flashbacks. So instead, um, I'm going to focus on an observation you make about peace building and development practice in the conclusion. Just let you say the places are wildly different, but the recommendations are suspiciously similar. And you have an explanation for this, uh, which I really like, which is that when we are outside of our familiar environments, we become anti-politics machines. And I love this observation, um, and I think, you know, it is correct that when we know less about a situation, we're more likely to rely on cognitive shortcuts, we miss out important context, and, you know, we overgeneralize from our conversations with taxi drivers. But I think you're being very generous to leave it at that, um, because when it does come to peace builders and development practitioners specifically, there are some easily identifiable patterns regarding which contexts are assumed to be reducible to simple frames and which are not, and with regard to who can have complex politics and who cannot. And I think it's worth teasing out the impact of some of those biases uh, because it goes to the feasibility of some of this centralization disruption uh, that you propose here. So you make the point that peace building and development practice often focuses on and strengthens the center. And part of that is due to time or information problems, right? A central power holder is a thing that's really easy to recognize from context to context. Um, I think the value placed on supposed neutrality also plays a role here. A defined center at least has facial legitimacy, right? So if you don't know the context well and you go looking for other actors and institutions to support, you run some risks. Um, and then partly I think this also has to do with the fixation on measurement. So if your funding stream depends on good performance on indicators that travel across contexts, you need to standardize your approach. So all of these, this belief in the possibility of neutral interventions, the belief in generalizable best practices, and the obsession with indicators, of course, have anti-politics outputs, right? We know this from reading the literature and just from like being around in these fields. 
Um, what I think we talked a little less about is that they also rely on anti-politics inputs. And um, I apologize, but everything is feedback loops with me all the time. So that's what I'm doing here. Um, and you say that a theme of, you know, your work here with this book is, and this talk today is, you know, what would development look like if we took political science seriously? And I want to ask instead, what would development look like? What would peace building look like? What would international intervention look like if we took power seriously? Because to believe that a neutral intervention is ever possible is to assume that you can act on a system without impacting the power dynamics therein. This ignores the fact that when we reinforce status quo power distributions, that's a profoundly political act. It also denies that those power distributions structure everything about the way policy is designed, implemented, and evaluated. So I think, you know, although peace building and development programming is often really explicitly premised on the idea that it's simply substituting for government functions in contexts where the state has retreated, where the state has given up, where the state is non-existent, it is state policies that create and maintain that retreat. Um, so interventions that step into that space are reinforcing that distance between marginalized populations and power. And likewise, when we think about what underpins a faith in generalizable best practices and scalability and the cult of the indicator, we again see a very strong assumption that the intervention matters more than the specificity of the context in which it is enacted. And that might be okay sometimes. So, you know, you mentioned in the conclusion the need to distinguish the simple problems from the wicked ones. But my assumption is that even if we were to try to sort development and peace building challenges that way into those that you know, reflect straightforward capacity issues from those in which there are political obstacles, we would probably hugely overcount the first category. Because again, where capacity exists and what it can be directed towards reflects political will and political power. Um, so I wrote, co-wrote a report a couple of years ago with Nimi Gauranathan and Rafia Zakaria, which was called Emissaries of Empowerment. Um, and we looked at a type of international intervention that I think is particularly prone to these anti-politics feedback loops, and that's women's empowerment. And we argue there that conceptualizations of problems that treat women in the developing world as victims stri stripped of agency lead to responses that prioritize interveners' judgment about what these women need. And that these interventions will often inadvertently reinforce rather than combat one of the main drivers of women's marginalization, which is their depoliticization by the state. And so much of this reflects a tendency to center the intervener rather than affected populations, right? So this, I have a hammer, you all look like so many nails thing. There's the racism implicit in assumptions about who has politics and who has capacity problems. And also just the general belief that by doing the thing that is easiest, most legible, most measurable to the outside interveners, that that is somehow helping. So personally, I try never to let myself get tricked into giving recommendations. Um, I think it's enough to just point out why things suck and then yell context matters while retreating to a safe distance. But you have made another choice here um, and you have made some recommendations. Um, so let me harass you about them a little bit. Um, your main, I think, recommendation for interveners is that we ought to work to the extent possible to decentralize and disperse political power and, quote, empower disempowered groups in society. I think we can all agree that a society where power is distributed widely and diversely is indeed optimal, but we're not choosing ex ante. Um, so many of the societies with the gravest development challenges are those with ruling elites who are most deeply invested in maintaining inequalities. Groups are not disempowered by accident. Marginalization is not a passive condition. It is an activity undertaken by the state. So disrupting these conditions is really difficult. Um, and as you point out, involves a pretty limited role for outsiders. And I think that the role outsiders can play, which you, know, you suggest is broadening mobilizational power, requires a really deep understanding of how political power is currently and historically distributed within a given context. 
And I've just run through a bunch of reasons why interveners tend not to develop that kind of deep understanding and, you know, prefer to avoid thorny questions like which political agents are deserving of our support. Um, so I want to close just by asking, you know, do we have examples of the types of interventions you suggest in terms of broadening mobi mobilizational power being effective in societies where there is deep investment in inequality, deep investment in centralization? Um, and then I also want to ask you a little bit of a wild card question, which is what kind of case is the United States 2015 to 20? 22 for you. Are our institutions saving us from worse conflict? Would we know that? Um, you know, what can you kind of tell us from your, your research in this book about the current situation? And I will stop there. Thank you. Comments. Great. Uh, That's a good set of comments. Uh, um, uh, you want to respond right now, or shall we take some questions and why don't, yeah, I mean, why don't I tackle these, um, yeah, why don't I, yeah. but, uh, I don't know where I should, maybe I'll look at, yeah, uh, look at the camera. you're kind of behind me, but you're also in front of me, so I'll, I'll, I'll do the best I can. Um, do we have examples? So, you know, I, I thought about how to finish this. Listen, the worst thing, the worst thing a, a professor can do at the end of a talk is just to say, oh, we need more research. <laughs> uh, and so I didn't want to end like that. I, I guess I do feel like because this hasn't been such a big topic of discussion and debate as a fundamental problem facing society. Um, ironically, yesterday, my, on my cab ride to the airport in Chicago, I had a Ghanaian who, uh, driver who was so upset that I was working in Africa because all he talked about was the evils of centralized power. And so I try not to, I do, I do much better quality of work than talking to cab drivers, but I did think it was, it was kind of ironic that my cab driver gave my presentation last night. <laughs> um, I feel like we don't have great, we, we haven't documented these examples systematically. And so in, in producing this, I'm glad it was only 30 minutes because if I had to go on another 10 minutes, I would have had to come up with all these great concrete examples. And, and I, I would have struggled. Uh, I, I think one of the reasons I defaulted to the easy and maybe effective ones, like saying, oh, let's just help, let's help more kids go to school. And probably that'll help in the long run. I mean, who knows? We don't really know. I think it's probably true. It's a good thing to do anyways. Uh, everybody, autocrats, Democrats, everybody seems to agree we should teach kids to read. Let's just do more of that. I think it'll help mobilizational politics in the long run, it would be nice if we did better. So I guess, you know, so my, my secret call is I wish we had more of a debate and discussion about this. So I wish that we could go a bit deeper and, and recognize, to do the same thing those books I highlighted did, which is recognize all the times that failed as well and, and how it can be naive and we can be anti-politics. Uh, so, so it, and it's sort of a personal project of mine. So Kate, you just have to, you need to ask me that question and then tear down my response in five years when I think I've answered that better. Because if I have like a next sort of longer term project, it's thinking about that. So that's my partly unsatisfying. But, but I just, my point is, I think we should all be talking about it. Uh, and, and then maybe reject it for the reasons Kate says, or, or maybe not. And then for the, yeah, for the US, I mean, James Madison said, I wish I, I should have memorized this quote. Madison and, and in the Federalist Papers, Hamilton and, and Madison and Adams, I believe, like wrote about, they actually, it's, I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to post this, I'll post this on my blog because it's so powerful. They basically said, listen, one day we're gonna have this sort of crazy, demo, you know, demagogic, you know, monarch wanting like autocrat and democratic clothing. And we need to make sure that the republic can stand up. And it just re it reads like Donald Trump. <laughs> um, so they, I don't know if they thought it would take, you know, it, it didn't take 250 years. You know, I think Andrew Jackson had a little of this flavor as well. Uh, so I, 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 you know, I'm kind of an, Kate, Kate's less of an optimist than me, I think. Uh, I tend to think American institutions did okay because of these checks and balances. Um, 
think the army and the military and the police actually held together to a surprising degree. I think a lot of things worked. Um, if anything, I have a good friend, Will Howell, who teaches at Harris, and he wrote a book. He had the misfortune of, I think, two months before Trump was elected, he wrote a book called Why the President Should Be More Powerful. <laughs> 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 he still believes it. Uh, he, America is an example of a nation that I think has taken checks and balances so far that we've just had institutional paralysis. And that's maybe part of the, that's kind of what makes populism, I think, resonate here. So, so, so he sort of actually thinks we should roll that back five or 10%. Uh, I think that's probably a good idea. And I'm not sure there's another country on the planet where I think it needs to move in that direction. I think everybody else would benefit from moving, you know, 30, 40, 50% in the direction of more checks and balances. But that's, that's, that, those are my short answers. Okay, great. Okay, now let's open it up. Anybody in? In, in your chat, yeah. Uh, hi, hi, I'm David. I could have to speak you, up for yeah, the could you stand audience. Up, uh, uh, stand up. Is though there? I think the mic has to hear you. Oh, uh, I'm David Kuzman. I'm a student at the Macor School of Public Policy. Uh, I have a question. You were talking about how leaders have uh, five reasons why they overlook the cost of work, and I was thinking like, what happens where societies? I have uh, like suffering from long-standing wars. Like, for example, I'm from Colombia. I've been in a war for like, 60 years. Yeah. This is not about leaders. There's be like society overlooking the cost, mm -hmm. or how do you think about conflict that being so <clears throat> long, like in time? Right. Uh, yeah. So, question: Why long wars, like in Colombia? Um, Barb Walter is a political scientist at UCSD who just wrote a book called "How Civil Wars Start." Uh, ironically, she didn't talk about her. Biggest contribution, the thing that's so influ influential to me, which is why civil wars go on so long. Maybe that's her next book. And I think she's somebody who pointed out number five, commitment problems. Mm -hmm. What I was saying, unreliable. In some sense, when, especially when it comes to civil wars, but you can make an argument that every long war involves a commitment problem. The specific commitment problem in a lot of civil wars, and I think Colombia is a classic case, I actually talking about it in the book, is you have to live together after the fighting stops, right? Like if you're two non countries fighting one another, you don't have to run a government together, right? So a settlement means both sides, rebels and the government have to govern. Uh, usually means in a civil war that the rebels have to put down their guns. The rebels have to believe that the government will not then either ignore them or kill them, right? And the one thing the Colombian government did repeatedly over the last 50 years is every time the guerrilla put down their guns or started negotiating, they used it as an opportunity to try to assassinate. And indeed, since the signing of the peace agreement, how many thousands of leftist labor leaders have been killed? So the commitment problem, which was very active and real in Colombia, is maybe arguably the chief reason why this is maybe one of the longest civil wars of the modern era. Uh, and, and it came to fruition, tragically. And so, so and, and that, is, that is an example of, I think, a, a, a place where outside actors can help solve those commitment problem issues, imperfectly, but I think that's where international actors can help solve civil wars. Uh, but obviously, imperfectly, because it didn't work out so well for a lot of leftist leaders in Colombia. Uh, let's go to London. Uh, any questions? I, I can't see everybody around the table. But... So we have here one here. Um, does Chris think humanitarian aid is risks prolonging wars through corruption, lowering the cost of war, etc.? So. Um, the short answer is there have been circum so, so that's a story, first of all, just to sort of say how things fit into the framework. In some sense, that's a story that, of that was unaccountability and unchecked interest, right? There's a general phenomenon that once a war begins, there's a risk that the people who are waging that war, the decision makers who are often not accountable, the warlords, have some either economic or political incentive to keep the fighting going, even though it's against the interests of their group. So if I'm Charles Taylor, maybe I want diamonds. 
right? If I am, and so all these sort of stories of a war economy. Um, if uh, maybe if the humanitarian aid, if I can sort of hijack it, and then not only maybe sell it, but then dole it out for political gain. Um, and there's some evidence, I think, you know, so, so, so Alex DeWall has talked about this and others uh, uh, in the context of, and Nancy Chen have talked about this in the context of, I think, particularly the Horn of Africa. I don't think it's a, I think it's an issue. I don't think it's like as big as the commitment problem I just talked about is extending civil wars. Um, but that's, but I think that's how to think about it is one of these examples of like that first cause, unchecked interest to have an interest in Columbia. Uh, let me ask this question. Oh, can you go, go, go down a bit? Uh, Paul Wotong is asking, would decentralized power address contested local resources for minerals and oil or make things worse? For example, the case of DRC or Nigeria. Um, you know, I don't know enough about DRC or Nigeria to give a a great answer. I know a lot more about places like Colombia. Um, I guess I would, it's not clear. So I think contestation is, is going to make contestation more intense because if you give people a claim to something and you give them political power or some other power in any circumstance to demand a larger share of the pie, they're going to demand it. And, and the other side's not going to like it. That's politics, basically, in, in a really simplistic form. And, uh, but the incentives to fight have not, the, the incentives for peace have not changed because fighting is still costly. So is it the case that if I have, one side is 90% of the power and the other side is 10% of the power, that that's more stable than both sides having equal power? I mean, on some level, no, because the war is still costly, so they both have incentives to avoid it. Uh, uh, if anything, I, I would I would think those more equal balances. I think there's some game theoretic reasons to think that maybe the more equal balances of power are more stable over the long run, but that's going to depend case by case. Uh, my colleague Jody Vittori has a question. Going back to your Russia example, if Ukraine can retake all or most of their land, what then? What can be done to minimize a return to war? Assuming a remaining unaccountable Russian regime. Um, so I spent a lot of my time talking to Russia experts these days, uh, so that I don't say things that are completely stupid and wrong. Um, I'm fortunate to have some great colleagues on this. Uh, all of them have given up on making predictions. <laughs> uh, they're, they're they're sort of done, they're fine, they're tired of being wrong. So this is keeps defying everyone's expectations. Um, let me like talk about the general principles and what I learned from all these wars in this framework and how that makes me think about what's happening next. Uh, uncertainty and misperceptions to those potential causes of this war have been dispelled. Okay, and so to the extent that they're still fighting, it's, Potentially, presumably because Putin is still unchecked, he has ideological incentives to continue his pursuit. Ukrainians have ideological incentives or desires to refuse compromise. Certain compromises are repugnant, but certainly the rhetoric. That too is a, a cause of, of the conflict. Uh, a nobler one, but it's still a cause. Um, so, so maybe fighting could go on for those reasons, but fighting is ruinous, right? That's, and you can see that the tens of thousands who've been killed and the cities that look like rubble are the obvious ones. Maybe the thing that's less obvious, uh, Ukraine requires about half, the, every month it requires roughly half of its monthly pre-war national income to wage a conventional war. And it's not earned that, obviously, right? It's not producing very much right now. And if it was, it can't export anything. 70% of its exports or something in that order used to go out with these Black Sea ports and there's a blockade. So it's not getting, it's not earning any money. So it's being bankrolled by the West. There was some ambiguity about how long that Western support would last. It seems like 
the United States in particular is committing to for the long term, which is basically making it easier and cheaper for Ukraine to fight a war of attrition against Russia. Okay, so Russia now looks at this and says, well, our whole strategy was to fight, well, we wanted the lightning strike to work like it did in, in Crimea, but that didn't work. So we, our second backup strategy that we use for use throughout history is the war of attrition, but that's extraordinarily costly to us, right? And it's, especially for a president who's built his reputation on economic growth. And, and, and besides, even if we, even though we, did, we have the, we could, we have the men and, and some of the material to keep fighting this indefinitely, we're gonna run out of parts for crucial things to for stuff. Um, so, and it's just phenomenally costly. And if you want to read this, Russian central bankers who are still surprisingly independent have been writing some columns on just how bad this is going to be for the Russian economy. It's really, it's, it's a ray of hope that they can, it must be really bad if they can say it's as bad as they said it was. So this is really costly. So the cost of war mattered, and that's maybe why most wars in history have been short. They're not 50 years long, like in Columbia. All right, so, so that gives me a little bit of hope. And then yesterday, Victory Day, Russia did not escalate, did not fully mobilize for war. That's a positive sign, I think. Uh, both sides have the capacity. So Ukraine has the capacity to, to fire missiles and start attacking nearby cities in Russia. And they haven't done that. And Russia has the capacity to send missiles and obliterate as much of Kiev as they want, and they haven't been doing that either, right? So what does that mean? Well, we can kind of guess, but to me, it kind of points to the two sides trying to like take this down a notch, see how these battles get resolved. Russia sits on the territory of controls in a few months, and then maybe it becomes like a new costume where nobody recognizes the legitimacy of their claims. And then for the next two generations, um, there's this they're, they're disputed territorial control that, and that's the optimistic scenario because there's a whole bunch of other scenarios where that, where Ukrainians, both who are occupied, those who are not occupied, resist that, and it continues to be quite violent. But, but these again, these costs of war you know, give peace this gravitational pull, and so that makes me a little bit hopeful. Frank. <clears throat> Yes, I'm, I'm Frank Weeby. I'm a professor at the McCord School and the director of the MIDP International Development Policy Program there. Uh, first of all, I really appreciate the presentation. I think the book is going to be a very helpful contribution, uh, including to students to help kind of think systematically about these issues. So you'll sign it in all your classes. For that. I will use it. I will use it. And, and to be honest, your, your, your comment about how it characterizes, in some sense, all bad policy, I think, is a, is a generalizable way to think about it, which is very helpful. Um, and I will use it in my class. Um, but I also think Kate's comment um, and her skepticism, right, um, is very useful. And, and, and for me, you know, the, the way to reconcile those is very kind of the, the old aid effectiveness debate, which is development institutions have, in fact, been working on some of these issues for a long time and have been very bad at it. I can talk about a USAID-funded project in Cambodia you know, 20 plus years ago that sought to decentralize power by, you know, but, you know, through information sharing, right? And, and had zero, you know, it was, a, it was considered an effective program, obviously had zero effect in any meaningful sense on the power that was shared within, within Cambodian society, right? And, 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 and ex ante, we could have known it would, right? It was a horribly conceptualized program, right? And so where I disagree with Kate is this idea of the cult of the indicator. To me, it's the cult of the wrong indicator or the easy indicator or the lazy indicator, right? What we need to know if your prescriptions are right is whether our actions, even at the margin, are having any meaningful impact, yeah. right? And how much they cost and whether it's worth trading off those even marginally meaningful impacts on decentralization against things in economic sphere we know we can do, like build roads and, yeah. and other things which we know raise prosperity and, and have yeah. other effects, right? So, 
So I know you have tried to measure some of these things in your in your own research. Yeah. Are we getting any better at understanding and measuring and valuing incremental changes in these issues you're talking about? Yeah. So, um, okay, so two things there. So one is, I mean, I, I'm the last part of the, the last chapter of the book, I assume that most people never get past chapter four of a book. I assume anybody who gets to the last chapter was really with me and so I could get kind of in the weeds. And that, and, and that was a place where I was trying, I was actually trying to be more skeptical, way more skeptical than the median person in this field and yank them in my direction of skepticism. And, and Kate is further on the skepticism, you know, uh, 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 spectrum than me. And, and she wants to yank me further. And I, you know, I think what she, she makes some good, good points. You know, I, I, I probably would, I, I think I just got yanked a little bit. Uh, so that's good. Um, the, the, I guess the way, one way I think about it, they're not answering your integrated question yet, but one way I think about it is like, my assumption is that this enormous machinery we have is going to point like a fire hose of cash and power at all of these countries and the people who receive this cash and pension. And so I just am like taking that as a given. I just want to like steer that in like less damaging ways on the margin. Sort of part of the way I decided to write the write the book. And that you know, I, Bill Easter is a good friend of mine and he, he did something like this a few days ago and we'll never agree on this, but that's where we differ. He just wants to like shut off the fire hose. I just want to, I, I said that's impossible. The fire hose is going to go, but I'm going to focus on like telling, telling people how to aim a little bit. <laughs> um, on the indicators, I don't know. I think that's a good point. Like cult of the indicator. I mean, I'm, I'm, Card carrying member of the cult of the indicator, uh, probably. Uh, does it make it worse? Um, I think it is an example of the way, okay, I think that standardization for non simple problems is a big issue. Uh, uh, and I think it is, might work, it works against this emphasis on decentralizing. Uh, at the same time, I think you do, every, you know, every, every person, every, every government, every bureaucrat, every president, every, you know, civil society leader, not, nor the foreigners, just the people who are trying to make their own society better, have to understand if what they just did made any difference, right? And so, and, and our qualitative assessments of programmatic progress, let me put it this way. I, when I do evaluate programs quantitatively, I sometimes spend months qualitatively observing these on the ground. I think I'm in like the 90th percentile of social science, of, of economists and political scientists who study programs, the amount of qualitative work they do. And I have been wrong. My qualitative assessment of how this program is doing, what I'm going to be fine, has been wrong like almost every time. So you can draw two conclusions from that. Either I'm a really bad qualitative researcher, which is very <laughs> true. Or it's also really hard to draw, we, we're human beings draw inferences from small samples mm -hmm. that are not representative of the whole. And so I think we do need to measure, and so I think just march of progress, which does happen, needs to happen, does require some indicators, but maybe we can, I don't know, balance against the cult. I don't know if, if maybe did I, maybe I pulled Kate a little bit in my direction and I don't know. Well, uh, I think we're running out of time, so uh, I want to uh, I want to thank uh, Chris and Kate for yanking us uh, <laughs> in uh, a variety. Yeah, sorry, of I think I need something different in UK. So <laughs> yeah, we gotta watch that. <laughs> uh, uh, for a uh, really stimulating uh, conversation, and uh, I, I think this is uh, you did what I asked you, which is to. Tell us what the future is going to look like, uh, and this is a very exciting future. It'll be in Frank Weeby's courses uh, in years to come, and my course too, uh, I should add. So thank you very much, and thank you to the audience for joining us.